uh, we come back to our study of the Baptists tonight. Remember that we are looking at why we're a Baptist church. There was a man 20 years ago named Elmer Towns wrote a book. Is the day of the denomination dead? If you've noticed over the years, many churches have dropped their labels. They're just called Grace Church or Faith Church or things like that. Some of them have just called themselves community churches and so on. They don't want any labels. And of course, many of the denominational differences have kind of gotten grayish between different denominations now as people go on in their modern thinking and changing things and so on. Uh, a lot of things have changed. And I want to emphasize the fact that a lot of Baptist churches have changed. We're not a Baptist church because that denomination is just so solid and great. Sadly, it's not. There are many Baptist churches that are liberal today that are not teaching and preaching the Bible like they should. The key is, are we a church that's true to the New Testament? That's where the church started, is in the Bible. And of course, we believe that through history, as we studied the history already of the Baptist church, that certainly people have tried to follow New Testament Christianity through these 2,000 years. They've been in the minority. They've been greatly persecuted back there for 1,000 years. But finally, the Baptists were the leaders in this, that in the Reformation time and afterwards really said it's important for us to follow what the Bible teaches about being a church. And of course, that led to the Baptist distinctives, as they're called. Certain things that are characteristic of Baptist churches, some of which you'll find in other churches, others you will not. All the Baptist distinctives are not followed by any other denomination. Uh, only the Baptists follow these distinctives, which we believe are biblical. And we last week saw up here the first one. We use the word Baptist to show you the Baptist distinctives. The first one is biblical authority. We believe what we are supposed to go by in what we believe and what we practice is from the Bible only. We don't take any other books. We don't decide on certain creeds and things that we're gonna follow as denomination. No, we say we are to follow the Bible. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. No individual man, woman, or anyone is the head of the church. It's Jesus Christ. And we are to follow him and his word. How do you follow Christ? His word. That's the only place we know about Jesus Christ. We don't know about him anywhere else. This is his word. He's given this to go by. So last week we studied the importance to us as Baptists of biblical authority. We base what we believe on the Bible, and all the rest of these are taught in the Bible. Tonight we come to the second one we want to look at, and it's called the autonomy of the local church. Now that's a big word, autonomy. What in the world does autonomy mean? It just basically means self-rule. Self-rule. We believe that Baptist churches and churches in the Bible absolutely followed self-governing. They did not have somebody above their church, a board or a synod or a big uh, council or bishops or all the rest of it that are over the local church. We don't find that in the New Testament. Every church made its own decisions. We're going to look at that tonight. Lots of decisions the church has made in the first century, and they made their own decision. Nobody told them what to do. Now, of course, the apostles started the churches, and the apostles had spatial miracle working power and powers of church discipline like Ananias and Sapphira faced and like the man in 1 Corinthians 5 was going to face at the hand of the Apostle Paul. 
but basically they taught the churches to make their own decisions about things. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight, how that the New Testament churches that started in the Bible times had their own authority. They made their own decisions, okay? So we want to look at that tonight. Does everybody understand what we're saying, what we're teaching? What autonomy of the local church is. All right? Let's start here looking at some of these verses. And the first one up there that you'll see we want to look at is Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6. In Acts chapter 6, we have the first church at Jerusalem. It began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 constantly had people being saved. If you look at Acts 2 and verse number 42, boy, this is exciting. Verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They had people getting saved daily in that first church. 3,000 day of Pentecost, you go to chapter number 4, there was 5,000 that were saved in chapter number 4, verse 4. I mean, the church was growing by leaps and bounds. Large church at Jerusalem. But they began to have a problem. The apostles, 12 of them, were trying very hard to meet everybody's physical needs and their spiritual needs. They couldn't do it when the church got thousands and it was thousands of people. So they had to have help. We call those first helpers deacons. And we see how they were chosen in Acts chapter 6. The apostles could have said, all right, I'm an apostle. I'm appointing this man, this man, this man to be the deacons. They didn't do that. Watch how the process took place in Acts chapter number 6. Verse 1. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples together. Notice they called people together. It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, who's he talking to? The church members. Church members. Look ye out. What? They were to choose. Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they asked the church members to choose seven men. What happened? Verse 5. The saying pleased the whole multitude, the whole multitude, the whole church. And look what they did. They chose. And then we have the list of the apostles that are, are mentioned here. I mean, the, the deacons that are mentioned here. Look at verse 6. Whom they set before the apostles, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. They put them into service. But the point to make here is the church made the decision about who the deacons were going to be. Very important thing to see because that's what we believe ought to happen with the officers of Calvary Baptist Church. The first important officer is the pastor. The pastor is not appointed by some council, some bishop or whatever like other denominations. The local church gets together, usually forms a pulpit committee first of all in this day and time, search out somebody to be the pastor and they bring that person in who is said to be a candidate and that candidate will preach, will meet with the pulpit committee, will meet with church people, mingle amongst them, and then, of course, the church will decide, is this someone we want to call to be our pastor or not? It's up to the church, the congregation of the church, and the church votes for the pastor. And, of course, it's up to the man who they issue the call to then after he's been here to see if he wants to take it or not. But that's how it works. The church has the power. Same thing with the deacons. The deacons need to be chosen from the church. And here we just had an election last week. A nominated committee forms, talks about people who are qualified and thinks of people to serve, and then they bring that to the church for the election. 
And the church elects those people into the offices that they have. This is autonomy of the local church. It's what we find in the New Testament and certainly believe the way that a Baptist church should operate. Let's notice the second one that this church did. Acts 13, turn there if you will. Not this church, excuse me. We move on to another church that's established by Acts 13, and that's the church at Antioch, Syria. This particular church had probably been started by Jewish believers that were uh, scattered out of Jerusalem during the dispersion of Acts 8. Persecution was there. They all started spreading everywhere, preaching the gospel. People got saved in other places, and a church got started in Antioch. None of the apostles that we know of started the church at Antioch, okay? It started other ways, but it became a good, strong church. Two men wound up there by the name of Saul and Barnabas. We know Saul better as Paul throughout most of the New Testament. Let's look what happens here in chapter 13 of Acts. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now notice, the Holy Spirit is the one that chooses people to be preachers and missionaries. So the Holy Spirit laid it on the hearts of these men to be missionaries. Notice, though, what happens in verse number 3. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost depart in Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus and so on. But here's the church at Antioch, the prophets, the teachers, the people in the church, choosing out when Saul and Barnabas said, God wants to be missionaries. They said, all right, we'll support you. We'll support you and send you out from our church. Later on, whenever they finished their first missionary journey, where did they return to? Go to Acts chapter number 14. Notice in verse number 26, it says, Thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they were fulfilled. When they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. That's the way we still do it today. We send out missionaries that we support. What do they do in the course of time? Come back to the church and rehearse the things and tell us the things that have gone on in their ministry. And of course, the last ones we just had here in November were the Freeze family to Cambodia. They came back through here, and it was good to see. I was concerned about what was happening with them, and it was good to see what's happening with them and how they've taken a good stand, have a church going, and so on. So they came and rehearsed, just like the New Testament says, to the church about what's going on. The local church, not a board, you know. Uh, even the Southern Baptists, you know what Southern Baptists do? Which I don't agree with. They have a mission board in their convention. Basically, each church absolutely sends their missions money to that convention. And the convention there then allots it out to all the missionaries that the convention supports. So the local church does not really make their decision about the missionaries they themselves want to support. They're supporting missionaries, but it's through the convention, the Southern Baptist Convention. So... I think it ought to be a local church decision, as we see here, about sending out missionaries. That ought to be the way it is, and it shows the autonomy of the local church with that. Let's move on. Here's a difficult one, but one the Bible teaches. Disciplining members. If you have members in your church that openly sin, then there's a process that needs to go through and the church has the power itself, not some particular individual, to discipline those people and kick them out of the church. Jesus first taught.
taught this. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Look how Jesus said people, uh, things are to be handled that need to be uh, disciplined. Matthew chapter 18. Look at verse number 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So if there's a problem between two people, the first thing they should do is not run and gossip to five other people, but they should get together, try to get that solved one-on-one. But sadly, that won't work sometimes. So then what do you do? Verse number 16. But if you will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So Jesus said, next, call with you a couple of others to go with you, spiritual people, people you know you can trust, people that know the word, people could be used. Send them with you and see if you can get the, pe the person uh, to confess, confess their sin and get it right. If they won't work that way, go on. Verse 17, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. So notice the ultimate authority of church discipline is the church. The church is supposed to hear the complaint when the person won't get right. One on one, two or three witnesses, then the church issues the, the need to get right. When they won't listen to the church, then the church has to kick them out, treat them like a heathen or a publican. They're no longer a member of your church because they will not get things right about their sin. So see the power of the church there. Now let's go and notice the next passage, 1 Corinthians 5, where the Apostle Paul teaches the very same thing. Here we have a very sad situation. Verse number one of 1 Corinthians 5. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Incest going on here. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. Now who is he writing all this to? The church, the church at Corinth. That he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Look what they were supposed to do. They should have been disciplining this man. They should have been mourning over what this man was doing. He should have been absolutely put out of the church. Go on. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. If you won't discipline him, as you should, as the church is supposed to, that's the power the church has, then I've got to come and take care of this guy. He had apostolic power being one of the apostles. The apostle Paul was going to have to come and deal with him. Now, here's why a church needs to exercise church discipline. Read on. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Well, he uses an illustration of leaven. He says here in this particular place, how much leaven does it take to just totally make a big loaf of bread? You put a little leaven in there and it just spreads, doesn't it? Makes something expand, grow. That's what leaven does. And his illustration here is that in the church, you let a little sin enter in and you know it, people know it, but they don't get it taken care of, it can spread. Other people can say, well, you know, if that Christian can do that, I can too. Nothing's being said, nothing's been done, and it can spread, especially with younger people. Seeing these sins are, oh, well, it's all right, then if I have sin like that and... You know, the examples are not set there. 
And so Paul says you shouldn't do that. Now, notice what he says in verse 9 and following. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So if somebody is guilty of a sexual sin, it's known, then they need to absolutely be disciplined by the church. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners. Here's another list that they ought to deal with. Covetous people, who would that be? Now that's a very tough one. Because sometimes people can be very materialistic minded and we wouldn't necessarily think of disciplining out of the church, but it would be somebody given over to more illegal activity with their monies. You know, it's wrong that we should be covetous and want more and more money and live for money, and that's what we're after. But here would be somebody, you know, that they just are overtaken with getting money any way they can and perhaps are not doing things properly. Um, well, yeah. That would be something for sure. That'd go back to fornication too. But, uh, you know, they might under the table be, you know, getting money from people for whatever they're doing and it's not legal or the way they ought to do things. I mean, I knew a man years ago, wasn't in our church, but in our school, that was paying his employees by cash so he didn't have to worry about paying uh, taxes on them. That's just wrong. And uh, the employees themselves could have got into trouble for it. So you know he shouldn't be acting that way. You got to do things legally. If somebody was doing that type of thing, then the church ought to say that's not right. You get it right or you can't be a member of the church when you're doing things wrong. And extortioners, we know that. Idolaters, which was big back in that particular time, of course. Verse 11, but now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that's called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or drunkard. Drunkenness is another cause for, uh, you know, expelling people from the church. Or an extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Look at this next statement. Do not ye judge them that are within? You're supposed to take care of your membership. And exercise discipline. This is written to the church. The church. Verse 13. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away. Who is he telling this to? The church. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So see the local church has the autonomy and the decisions about who should be in their membership and who should not be in their membership. The local church has that power. That's part of their self-governing power. All right? Well, let's look at another thing here. Receiving messages from the Lord. Rather than turning there, let me just explain Revelation 2 and 3. Does anybody know what we have in those two chapters? Seven what? Churches. The seven churches of Asia. When God wanted to give a message to that church concerning what they're doing and the need to repent, who did he write to? The angel. Now, angelos in the Greek means the messenger. So who would be the one that would bring the messages to the church? The pastor. So those messages are written to the pastor, to the church, each individual church. Not to some board or some synod or some presbytery or something that's over the church. To the church directly because they themselves, each individual church, had responsibilities to the Lord. The church has one head. Who is it? Jesus. In Colossians 1.18, he's the head of the body of the church. That in all things he might have the preeminence. He's the one that we follow, and he is the one through his word that we absolutely follow the things he says to do in our church. And so he wrote to those individual churches, to that church, to the pastor, to get things corrected in the church. Showing again the autonomy of that local church. Now some people, when they hear those type of things, say, well... We read in the Bible about elders and uh, bishops. Where do they come in? Where do elders and bishops come in? 
They are pastors. Let me prove it to you. Let's first go to the book of Acts. We'll see how these terms are used interchangeably. Acts chapter 20. Notice what it says in Acts 20, verse number 17. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. The elders of the church. So notice who he's calling here. But I want you to go further down as he talks to them and sees what he, see what he calls them in verse number 28. In our King James English, it doesn't have the Greek word, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Do you see that word right there? In the Greek, it's bishopric. It is translated other places in the New Testament, bishop. So who did he go call together in verse 17? Elders. In verse number 28, they're also called bishops. They're one and the same. Now, let's get it even closer to understand it. Go to the book of Titus. Titus chapter number 1. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews is where you're at there. In Titus chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. Each city need an elder. So what would they have to be? A pastor. Notice. As I had appointed thee, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, watch, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. He uses elders and bishop interchangeably. It's the same person. He's telling the qualifications of one right here in this passage of Scripture. Every city needed an elder, needed this bishop. They were... What these terms really indicate are what the pastor's to do. The only other term in the New Testament for elder and bishop is poimain, which means pastor. It's found one place in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11, where God talks about pastors there. Poimain means a shepherd. So a pastor is supposed to shepherd. What do you think he's supposed to be as an elder? A leader, a leader. And what does it say here a bishop does? The word overseer. He is to oversee the ministry of all the church and see that things are going properly according to the way that the church ordains and the Bible ordains. That's what a pastor is to do. Is a pastor to be a dictator? No. That is plainly taught in 1 Peter chapter 5. Turn there right fast and notice what Peter says about how a pastor needs to operate. And notice what he calls pastors here. Verse 1, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. What's an elder supposed to do? What's a pastor supposed to do? Verse 2, feed the flock. Well, a pastor is also a poimane, shepherd. So he feeds the flock. See? All these terms are interchangeable. Taking the oversight. Oh, there's the word for bishop again. Taking the oversight. He's writing to elders. He mentions poimane here, shepherding, feeding the flock. He mentions here bishop as well, overseers. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not trying to earn a big salary and money off of people, but of a ready mind. Now watch verse 3. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. There's where pastors not to be a dictator, but being examples to the flock. The pastor should lead by example. Shouldn't expect people to do things that he wouldn't do. Uh, certainly should lead by example. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Notice how Jesus is called the chief shepherd because a pastor is an under shepherd to feed the flock. See? So these terms are all used interchangeably. They talk about 
pastors. And what you find in the Bible are pastors. Now, when the church has got larger, I have more than one pastor, which we still do today. In our church, we have two pastors. Uh, well, I guess I'd be called the senior pastor. I'm senior. And then uh, <laughs> assistant pastor, you know. So a lot of churches have more pastors than that if they're large. So you have uh, a lot of pastors, but they're pastors. And there's not an elder board or something else higher up that rules over the churches and does that kind of thing. Every church is responsible for itself before God. So... The local church should make its own decisions about doctrine, and hopefully the local church makes the right decisions about doctrine. We have made a statement of faith in our Constitution, and that statement of faith has scriptures all the way through it to show why we believe what we believe. But we decide that ourselves. Sadly, if a church was autonomous, they could decide false doctrine. And some Baptist churches do, but the authority for what they believe is in the local church. Staff, the pastor, the deacons, or others, like in our particular place here, we have teachers, secretary, different staff members there, you know. The church decides all these people that will be there. Missionaries, we've talked about that. The monies. Our men met last night to go over the budget for 2020. That will be presented to the church in January. And you all will decide if that will be the church budget we go by or not. That's what is in the power of the church, the monies. Programs, what kind of programs will run here at the church, ministries. A lot of this stuff we put in our church constitution years ago. We started the school ministry. It's in the Constitution. The church voted to start it, set up all the articles of how it's going to run. It's in the Constitution. Sunday schools in the Constitution. We pull all things in the Constitution of what the church will have as ministries. Now, there's some ministries sometimes we have that are not in the Constitution. Some people get together as, you know, people in the church say, let's have a ladies' a prayer chain. Uh, let's have uh, men's prayer breakfast. Let's have different things like that going on. Uh, so, you know, various things start up like that, that we don't put everything in the Constitution we do, but it's made up of church people doing these things. Okay? So this is a big issue. We believe that each church is responsible directly to Jesus Christ and to his word, and that the church makes the decisions for itself, good or bad, then they're going to answer to the Lord Jesus for that out there in the future. But the church is self-governing. That's really what we see in the New Testament, self-governing churches. All right, Dr. Bruner. Mm-hmm. Cover the cost of food, right. Mm -hmm. What if there's a $5, $5 extra? Is there a common fund that that goes into? Yes. Any extra monies, uh, we deposit them with Floyd, and he keeps that in the church account. That would be it goes into the church. Yeah, the church account is where he has it. Mm -hmm. So that's how it is. Mm -hmm. We pay the individual people who, who cook it for their expenses of what they spent on buying the food. So um, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. But there's usually, thanks to the good giving of you men, more than's necessary, so we just put it into the church fund. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions about what we study tonight? I hope you understand it and uh, see the importance of this particular Baptist distinctive. We'll move on next week to priesthood of all believers. What in the world does that mean? Simply put, it means you are a priest. But what all do you do? What's the Bible teach about that? We'll see that next Wednesday night, Lord willing. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to study this subject of the autonomy of the local church. You are the founder of the church. The church is responsible to you. You are the only one in Scripture called the head of the church. We are to follow you. 
And to follow you, we must have biblical authority. We must follow your word, as we studied last week. That's where you tell us what to do as a church. And that's what we want to stay faithful to. And as we make our decisions here under your leadership through your word, Lord, we want to make them pleasing to you because we'll answer to you for the decisions we make here in the future. Bless us now as we go from here tonight and give us a good remainder to this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you're dismissed tonight. God bless you.